Hi, welcome to this week's Research Insights. Today I'm pleased to be joined by Professor Marcus Giesler. Marcus is the chair of the marketing department at York University and a world-class scholar and leading expert on consumer culture, brands, and technology. In this interview, Marcus will share his research insights on how the analog is resisting the digital and provide you with some helpful tips for putting this knowledge into practice. Thanks for joining us today, Marcus. Thanks, Eric, for having me. It's a pleasure. Marcus, could you tell our learners a bit about yourself and your research? Sure. My name is Marcus Giesler. I'm the chair of the marketing department at the Schulich School of Business at York University, and my research focuses on changes in market systems. So I look at how technology and other forces change markets and how that in turn changes our experiences as customers. Great. And Marcus, you've done some important research on the digitization of music, your project on Napster, for example. Uh, and you've also worked in the uh, music industry in a prior life. That's true. Um, so you're an expert in this domain. So one thing that's curious to me is given this incredible digitization, all the benefits that it provides in the music um, industry, and a as a consumer of music, why are people especially young people today, still seeking analog experiences in this domain? I think that when something is analog, it is contained. It is there for me to enjoy and it's reliably accessible. Whereas when something is digital, it's constantly in motion. It becomes portable and transferable. So maybe this current resistance we're seeing to the digital and the sort of resurgence of the analog is a response to things being so liquid, being so in motion, mm. and consumers having a desire to stop it, to mm. put what used to be no longer accessible back into a state where it becomes accessible, where it mm. is um, unique, where it is something that exists for me and for me only. So are you suggesting that we have a, a need for stability or structure, and that perhaps the digital age may be pushing against that need? I think that when something becomes digital, it becomes so replicable that it loses its uniqueness. And maybe we as humans don't necessarily have the need to stop things and, and the need for slowness, but the need for uniqueness, the need to establish strong and enduring emotional bonds with objects. And when these objects are analog, they are more easily accessible to become something that's ours. And I think that's one thing that definitely drives the current return or resurgence of analog. How about the, um, the notion of physicality? The mm -hmm. fact that when you have a, um, think about it, an album, yes. you have this uh, cover sleeve, the art on the cover, you're pulling out this black yes. disc, placing it, yes. perhaps moving the, uh, the needle. Mm -hmm. That physical experience versus um, you know, perhaps pressing a button on yes. your smartphone. Yes. Um, everyone who loves music and has had uh, interactions with physical carriers of music, like a vinyl record, for instance, knows that music doesn't just sound, it also touches and senses and feels differently. So that when you, know, you have a vinyl record, you can establish a very different relationship, not only with the artist and the art, but also with mm -hmm. you know, yourself. So that physicality, that touch, set, touch sense, and, and smell is something that's part of the experience that we don't have when we listen to music on Spotify, where all I have is just my cell phone and access to a database with a million songs. So I think that is something that helps distinguish what I do as an artist, what I do as a marketer from others in the marketplace. So that's why physicality matters, because it, is, it adds materiality, it adds something that allows me to distinguish myself from the competition. So you're suggesting, in this context at least, in the context of, of analog music, it's a much richer sensory experience than the digital alternative? There's the sensory aspect of that, and then there is the aspect of being able to establish a very specific relationship bet between yourself and something that you actually have around. Mm. You know, music on Spotify is not something you have around. It exists in the cloud, whereas mm. 
an album that I used to have on the shelf when I was a teenager was something that I knew uh, how to interact and deal with, and therefore it was very special to me. So it could stay with me. There is a difference between ownership and access. That's the other thing. So in addition to physicality, I used to just own my records. Now I'm mm -hmm. accessing them. That's a different thing, and maybe you know consumers desire ownership more than marketers mm -hmm. thought they would. And we're currently going through this digital revolution, a change in materiality, right? Mm -hmm. That we're, yeah. Well, it, what we experience on the one hand is dematerialization. So as stuff becomes more digital and transferable, it also becomes dematerialized and less accessible in material form. But then at the same time, and that's the really fascinating thing, we're also seeing rematerialization. Things that used to be intangible are becoming tangible, now accessible mm -hmm. and portable and ownable, I'm sorry. I think a great example of that, Marcus, is um, uh, emojis. Mm -hmm. Uh, which began digital form, right? And now I'm starting to see uh, analog, physical emojis. Yes, such as the uh, Kakao Talk friends in uh, the Seoul subway now. Yes, and these giant statues. Yes, I was in New York the other day, mm -hmm. and I was at LaGuardia Airport, and there was a store that was selling emojis, emojis as plush toys, and that's just an example of a rematerialization. Mm -hmm that has happened in consumer culture. So it's no longer enough to have emojis just in the digital sphere where they're you know, abstract and intangible, but we mm -hmm. want to touch, sense, and feel them. And that's, that enriches mm -hmm. the experience for us as customers. And it's almost a complete reversal of the digital revolution, yes. which began by taking analog things and digitizing them. Yes. And now we're taking digital things right. and making them analog. Absolutely, which is a great insight for the students if you think about how we conventionally think about progress. We shouldn't make the mistake of always thinking about technological evolution as something that evolves towards the better. What we see here is that the digital and the analog, the material and the immaterial are interacting in interesting and complex ways to shape the markets that we live in and the landscapes that we as marketing managers need to navigate. And let me follow up with, uh, and we've been talking about, about this tension, but could you address the essential difference between these two forms of materiality, the analog and the digital, mm -hmm. as a consumer? An analog object, something that exists as an analog representation, is potentially more unique than its digital counterpart. Why? Because the digital counterpart can be replicated infinitely. So a uh, love letter that I wrote in my teenage years, that's an, annual art, an, an analog artifact that still has its uniqueness across time and space. If I were to scan this love letter and make it accessible on my website, it would no longer have that uniqueness, that authenticity, mm -hmm. especially not to the recipient. So you see that digital objects can still be material, but less authentic. And mm -hmm. that is uh, something that's interesting for marketers, because mm -hmm. what we are trying to do is we're trying to make objects distinguishable and valuable to consumers. Mm -hmm. And authenticity is one of those variables that helps us accomplish that. So here the analog becomes a strategic factor for marketing success. Mm. So you're suggesting that authenticity perhaps is more closely related to the analog than to the digital. It is. And it has to do with the fact in which, uh, in, in which analog and digital have been culturally understood. When we think digital, we think replicability, we think um, you know, transferability, something that's superficial. It has no depth anymore. Mm. But the analog it has the depth. It has the depth quite literally in the kinds of sounds we hear differently or the kinds of imagery that we can see and associate with analog. But also depth, depth in terms of perception, how I think about something uh, as analog is differently than what I think about it as digital. Are these uh, cultural experiences different across generations? Say, for someone like me as a digital immigrant <laughs> who grew up in the analog world and then and it's making a shift mm -hmm. to the digital world versus my, my, my sons who grew up in the digital world. Right. Your sons are probably digital natives. You're an analog native. So for you, the new world of digital becomes the, the environment within which you have to evolve into a new type of consumer. Mm -hmm. uh, but it is interesting to observe that younger consumers are, in some sense, returning almost to the appreciation of analog, mm -hmm. similar to how we did when we were young. Uh, so what we're seeing is a certain circularity and re repetition of history in interesting ways. So both analog and digital now coexist to shape our realities as consumers, and different generations perceive those realities differently, but both of them draw upon digital and analog equally, I would say.
So we're having different lived experiences? Different lived experiences around the difference between digital and analog. And that makes mm -hmm. consumption fascinating and captivating and interesting and diverse because we can never quite agree on what's better, digital or analog. For some of us, it's the former. For others, it's the latter. I agree. And Marcus, one of your current research interests is uh, retro branding. Mm -hmm. Is there any relation between retro branding and analog? Absolutely. Um, the analog could be thought of, the analog object, consumption object of a product, could be thought of as a time capsule, something that carries meanings from an earlier point in time. And that's an additional aspect of consumption that often gets overlooked, that something becomes desirable not because it exists in the present, but because it represents the past. Uh, one great example of uh, an object that we study right now, an analog object, is uh, products and brands from the German Democratic Republic. That's something that's long gone. So for 25 years, Germany, or the east of Germany, has not been socialist. Germany was reunified 25 years ago, and ever since then, uh, Western capitalist brands and products have prevailed. But you can witness quite interestingly that consumers in the East still prefer those socialist brands even though they have Coca-Cola uh, and even though they have other nice Western brands they prefer the Eastern socialist counterpart and I think that has to do with them associating those products and brands symbolically with a bygone era that they perceive was so much better than what they have today. Interesting and, and you're finding this retro branding effect is more pronounced for analog products than digital ones? I guess by definition because right. the digital is, is too new? I think there is a certain uh, propensity or a characteristic about analog products that make, make them very um, conducive to carrying retro meanings, nostalgic, mm -hmm. idealized representations of the past because mm -hmm. um, they are more authentic and more credible in carrying those meanings than mm -hmm. digital objects. Although it's also possible to imagine a digital representation of a Beatles album that has nostalgic value to us as consumers because we may remember it from back in the day. But I think the analog representation is stronger. It's more emotional. It's more desirable for most consumers. Mm -hmm. Marcus, what else should our learners know about analog resistance? I think it's important to remember that analog and digital coexist and that uh, in order for us to succeed in an environment where this happens, we have to carefully understand how consumers perceive the relationship between these two and their everyday consumption. So what are the experiences that analog and digital constitute? What are the conditions under which I as a consumer resist the digital through the analog and vice versa? Doing so can help us better understand consumption in general, but it also can make or break our momentum of success as marketing managers. Are there some uh, specific methodologies or techniques that a, a marketing manager should pursue? Mm -hmm. uh, for example, um, focus groups, surveys, mm -hmm. uh, ethnography? We can do focus groups and surveys to understand the relationship between analog and digital. I personally prefer ethnographies or projective techniques, sometimes even uh, participant observation. Just observing others interact with digital or analog objects can really help you shed some light on what drives people uh, in consuming these objects. Great advice. And finally, Marcus, where can our learners find out more about you and your research. Sure, I have a research website and blog, and if you want to learn more about my work, I highly invite you to come to www.bigdesignlab.com. And it's a fantastic website. If you're ever in uh, Toronto, you should check out Marcus's lab. He does amazing work. Thank you so much, Marcus. Thank you, Eric. Thanks okay. for having me. Good to have you.